all you need to do is just um, stop your video so that no one can see your, your face. Uh, we debated a bit about how to, to do this, whether to make it rebroadcast just as a webinar, but we went with a Zoom call so everyone can, everyone that can see. Um, so it feels a bit, um, a bit more, a bit more like we're in the room together, I suppose. Right, I'm going to stop sharing. Just admit the last couple of people. Fantastic. So it's wonderful to, to see everyone. We've just got a, a tiny bit of housekeeping just to um, make sure that we try and reduce the background noise. Can everyone stay, stay muted um, while we're on the call? I'll be asking um, panelists to speak. Everyone else who's got a question, please pop that into the chat. Sally's going to be keeping an eye on, on that so that we can get as many questions um, through as we can. Um, really pleased to see so many people. This is our first walk wheel cycle vote event. Um, it's sort of sad that it has to be online, but actually in many ways it becomes more inclusive. We're able to get many more people in the room. Uh, it's certainly easier than, than traveling uh, around Scotland on a well, not particularly pleasant evening here in East Lothian. Um, We've got over 40, over 50 um, sporting organisations um, on the Walk Cycle, Walk Wheel Cycle Vote supporter list now. We're really pleased to have a really good selection of disability activist groups, environmentally concerned groups, people that are interested in children's play, health groups, and as you would expect, the active travel groups. I'm going to introduce uh, the panel now. Some of those, so our panel is from the supporting groups. So we have Sandra Wilson, who's the chair of RNIB Scotland. And we have Maureen Morrison, who's the chief officer at Spine Factory. I have just seen Shagufta into the room, which is fantastic. Um, Shagufta is the third person on our panel and she's the active travel lead at Bike for Good in Glasgow. Shagufta, good to see you. I'm also going to briefly introduce the candidates. They're going to kick off in a few minutes with their three minute vision each. We've got Carol Ford from the Scottish Liberal Democrats. We've got Katrina MacDonald from the Scottish National Party. Graham Simpson from the Scottish Conservative Party. Mark Ruskell from the Scottish Green Party and Sarah Boyick from the Scottish Labour Party. So we're all delighted that you've given up your time to join us tonight. Thank you very much. So the first thing we're gonna do is up, turn to each candidate and ask you to give your three minute vision on the Walk Wheel Cycle Vote Pledges, which is all about ensuring that Scotland is a place where anyone can walk, wheel or cycle in safely for their everyday journeys. So I'm gonna go through my list and ask Carol to Talk to us for a few minutes about that first. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, the Liberal Democrat approach to transport issues, which obviously includes active travel, is based on four major concerns. The first of these is the climate emergency and the need to get people out of their cars, since that's the, the greatest source of harmful emissions. The second is about the actual individual experience people have when traveling. And I think particularly in relation to things like cycling and walking, that experience is vital because that's what's going to influence their decision-making and their, and their behavior. And the other issues that involve their um, tra transport decisions are based on are about the economic impact of transport decisions and decisions that affect social equity, health and well-being. Now, in relation specifically to active travel, of walking, cycling, other fields, forms of transport, it's about the individual experience and it's about the health and well-being of citizens. These are the two key areas for us. So we would be looking, first of all, to improve the actual transport system in Scotland, that is trains and buses and so on, and to make those elements of transport as friendly to foot passengers and people with bikes and other field equipment. We need improved walking routes and improved cycling paths. That's absolutely critical 
but they also need to join up to transport hubs because that's the only way that people will be able to make longer journeys and to use that kind of transport for everyday commuting. Similar to what you see in countries like the Netherlands, where you know, outside railway stations, you have enormous bike racks, people are using both forms of transport. We actually need to entice people to walk or cycle. For some, it's a joy. For others, we, we need to actually draw them into that. So we are proposing regional transport partnerships which will actually make these joined up decisions, looking at transport routes and timetables, walkways, cycle paths, and creating that network of safe, convenient alternatives to motorized transport. So when we make this investment in cycle paths and walkways, it needs to look further than them as simple routes in themselves, but how they connect to the rest of the transport network. And People who are walking and cycling need to be the first consideration when we're making transport decisions, not an afterthought. So something simple like how far the bus stop is from a ferry terminal might determine whether someone decides to go as a foot passenger or take their car. That kind of detailed thinking is necessary. For cyclists, safety is the biggest issue. Uh, people who don't feel safe are not going to cycle on our roads. And so we need to look at the safety of cyclists first and foremost, if, if we're going to get any number of people to switch to that form of transport. And finally, the COVID crisis has highlighted the health crisis in Scotland, the high levels of obesity and type two diabetes. So when we create these walkways and cycle paths, we also need bike parking. Where do you leave your bike when you get to your destination? We need changing places for commuters, and we would be looking at challenge funding to businesses and other community areas to create that, these facilities for people. We need, as I said, the bus stops in the right place so that people actually feel comfortable about taking their bike a certain way of the distance and then perhaps using a bus or a train. We quite literally need joined up thinking because without that joined up thinking, we will not entice large numbers of the population to walk or get on their bike. And that requires local decision-making, the kind of decisions that cannot be made from a desk in Edinburgh. Excellent, thank you. Katrina, can I call on your next, you next, please? Absolutely, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm Katrina MacDonald, the SNP candidate for Edinburgh Southern at this year's Scottish Parliament election. I'm really happy to support this campaign and I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion on how we can make sure that everyone in Scotland has the opportunity to walk, wheel and cycle safely in their communities. Um, my priority for Edinburgh Southern and for Scotland is a sustainable recovery from the pandemic that puts our communities, our public services and our planet first. The climate crisis hasn't gone away while we've been dealing with the pandemic, in fact quite the opposite. We're now entering the parliamentary term, which scientists have said is our last opportunity to act. So there's no greater priority than a sustainable recovery that restructures our economy, our infrastructure and our society to protect nature and prevent further climate change. At a local level, transport, how we move around every day, how we go about our daily business has a key role to play in that sustainable recovery. Lots of us have already seen big changes to travel and transport in our communities during the pandemic. Across Scotland, local authorities have had to respond to public health measures to allow people to walk, wheel and cycle whilst also physically distancing and being kept safe from traffic. As someone who both walks and cycles, I find it really exciting to see how we can actually use public space differently to create new travel infrastructure that centres safe active travel. The, um, the temporary spaces for people schemes, which were funded by the Scottish Government and managed by Sustrans, have created space for us to move about more freely and more safely with people prioritised over cars. Um, measures like segregated cycle lanes on busy roads have been particularly useful to people like me as someone who's hard of hearing. I feel much safer and more confident cycling and actually walking on the roads with these kind of measures. So if the SNP is re-elected, and I hope their parties will also agree with this, that 
we should work with communities to make sure that the successful examples of these spaces for people schemes can become permanent. And I'm particularly interested in making sure that the opportunities for children to get to school safely, which certainly around my, my local area have been really successful and really popular, are preserved and are improved upon more permanently. Um, but this kind of restructuring requires investment. So I'm really pleased that the Scottish Government has made a five year commitment of over £500 million for active travel. That will permit investment in large scale programmes. So that includes ambitious active travel infrastructure projects, which may span several years, but will encourage more people to walk, wheel and cycle more often. The SNP actually worked with the Greens to deliver this increase to that to travel budget as part of extra investment in a green recovery from the pandemic. So that's a good example of how we can work together to deliver this positive outcome for our communities. Um, the, the next five years will be defined by global challenges like our recovery from COVID and the climate crisis. I believe that with the full powers of independence, we can rise to these challenges together. But in the meantime, we can work towards a sustainable recovery by taking action in our local communities and across Scotland to restructure our local infrastructure, create accessible active travel options and make sure that everyone can walk, wheel and cycle safely in their own communities. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Graham, can I call on you next, please? Yeah, um, thanks very much, Suzanne, um, and thanks for organising this uh, event. Um, I hope you all get get something out of it. Um, just for a bit of background, um, I started off my political life as a councillor in, in South Lanarkshire, that's where I live, I live in East Kilbride, uh, and that's where I'm standing in the Scottish Parliament. And while I was a councillor, um, I successfully managed to persuade the council to form the South Lanarkshire Cycling Partnership, uh, which is still on the go. Um, this was uh, uh, basically a grouping of various stakeholders and we managed to put, I think we managed to successfully put cycling uh, on the map in, in South Lanarkshire and the evidence of that was when I attended um, a, a funding bid um, at Sustrans where we were pitching for money uh, to finish off, it was the missing piece of NCN 74 um, round about Les Mahago and I think it was the first time then um, that they'd actually seen a councillor come along to one of these meetings and uh, pitch for money and we were successful uh, and so that route um, is now has now finished uh, and now South Lanarkshire Council has um, designed um, a cycle network for the town where I live East Kilbride and that's exactly what we ought to be aiming for is to have networks uh, in all our towns and cities that people feel safe to use uh, and that's the way to encourage people uh, out on their bikes uh, and and walking in fact when you think about it new towns like like the one where i live were very often designed with these sort of networks but they've fallen into disrepair and disuse so um, i've got four themes that i want to commit to better streets for cycling and people cycling and walking at the heart of decision making uh, and empowering and encouraging local uh, authorities like South Lanarkshire to do the right thing and enabling people to cycle and protecting them when they do and that's when these segregated uh, schemes come in like spaces for people. Now I'm all in favour of things like spaces for people but Katrina uh, used the phrase that we have to work with communities we absolutely do. We need to bring communities with us, but there are too many bad examples uh, of where councils have not done that with spaces for people and it's become needlessly unpopular. So uh, I think we need to do things better. Um, these are very, very good schemes, but we need to get them right and bring communities with us. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Mark, can I call on you next? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Suzanne. And uh, yeah, great to see so many people on this call tonight. Um, yeah, the Scottish Greens, we absolutely back the walking, wheeling, cycling uh, vote manifesto. Uh, congratulations for, for getting that out early. Uh, and I'd also like to thank many of the people on the call tonight who 
will have actively campaigned for my members bill in the Scottish Parliament to reduce the speed limit on the streets where we live, uh, work and play down to 20 miles an hour. Um, very much appreciate the support that I had from, from you all for that. Um, the bill unfortunately didn't go through, uh, but that campaign lives on. And certainly if I'm re-elected to the Scottish Parliament, I'll be looking at other ways to introduce a default 20 mile an hour to make our streets safer. And I think, you know, there's a strong logic behind that bill to the point now that Wales is introducing a default 20 mile an hour, which will be in place for 2023. So thanks very much for your support with that campaign and we're not stopped yet. Um, I'd like to say just a little bit about some of your asks around uh, investment in particular and around priorities. Um, the investment's hugely important. Uh, and if we can front load that investment in infrastructure, good infrastructure that benefits everybody, then uh, you know, it's a case of build it and they will come. You know, people will use it. Uh, young people will use it, older people will use it. People with disabilities will hopefully be able to access it as well if it's designed correctly. And we do need to see a real step change of investment in that infrastructure. And we've got an opportunity to do that because of the COVID crisis and the changing nature of our high streets and communities and our growing awareness of the land around us and the ability uh, and the opportunities that exist for active travel. Unfortunately, what we've seen so far though is uh, successive governments really paying lip service to the transport hierarchy. We know how it should be. It should be walking at the top uh, and then cycling and then public transport uh, and then the private motor car at the bottom. And that is Scottish government policy at the moment. It's transport policy. But when it comes to capital budgets and investment, that gets flipped on its head. Uh, we see trunk roads like the A96 and the A9 costing £6,000 million pounds, uh, being put forward by the Scottish government. So we, we need consistency and coherency here when it comes to government policy. Now, my own party has been you know, pushing that, that budget issue over the last few years. We managed to get the, uh, the budget for active travel increased from a, a really paltry 40 million up to 100 million, and then increased again up to 115 million this year. Um, but we're not finished there. I mean, that, that still only represents around 3% of the total transport budget. So I think the ask in your manifesto to see a 10% of that transport budget at the start of this next session of Parliament rising up to 20%, I think is achievable and it is realistic. And actually, uh, I was talking to my Green colleagues uh, in Ireland uh, the other week who are now in a, in a coalition government and they've just achieved that. They've just achieved a 20% of the transport budget in the Irish government now being put into active travel, walking and cycling. Um, I think there are opportunities with our high streets. Um, to, to reconfigure them, particularly now we're seeing a real shift in our high streets, particularly retailers moving out. We need some really critical thinking about how we regenerate our high streets and make active travel a key part of that. Um, and, and move to a point where the car is a guest in our communities uh, and in our high streets, and we have much more freedom and much more access to that road space for creative use um, alongside uh, working, continuing to work on establishing better, safer routes to school uh, and alongside ensuring that rural communities are better connected into urban centres by infrastructure as well. And, and at the heart of that needs to be the agenda you've set out in terms of accessibility as well. When I, when I talk to um, people with disability who I know, they say, you know, nothing about us without us we need to ensure that those who have particular challenges in terms of access and disabilities are involved in setting the design standards for this work and are also involved right at the outset in terms of designing schemes that come through as well because ultimately if we're designing our communities that are better for people with disability better for children and better for older adults then we're making places that are actually better for all of us as well and I think that, that's a, a great objective to have in this post-pandemic world where we're trying to make our communities much greener, safer and more enjoyable as well. So thanks very much for inviting me and I really look forward to the discussion. There's some great questions coming in on the chat box that could keep us here till midnight, I think. <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Unless we don't have until midnight, so we're going to move swiftly on to Sarah. 
Hi, well, it's great to be here tonight. And as a Scottish Labour candidate, I think the next Scottish Parliament's got to focus on how we recover from COVID-19. So rebuilding our economy, um, getting energy efficient homes, recovery plan for the NHS, and supporting people's well-being and mental health, which has, has actually been given a huge focus during the pandemic, and tackling our climate emergency and the deep-seated inequalities in our communities that we've seen exacerbated by the pandemic. And I believe that in all of those ambitions for recovery, encouraging people to walk, wheel and cycle safely, and getting the infrastructure to do that has a key role to play. The problem is we've been going in the opposite direction and we need to change how we plan and invest in our communities. If you look at research in Edinburgh, it showed that new housing that's being built didn't have bus services or dedicated walking and cycling routes so that people were forced to buy cars to get to work and get their kids to school or go shopping. And as others have said, I believe we need to see local communities involved in reshaping our built environment. And that will make it easier and safer for people to walk, wheel and cycle if we're actually using their own experience. And in the early days of the Scottish Parliament, when I was Transport Minister, I introduced 20s plenty zones to make communities safer and more attractive, and they worked. And I think our communities also need to be more accessible. They need to be safe for everyone, and people who've got sight loss, who are blind, who use crutches or wheelchairs to get about, need to see our pavements, our crossings, our bus stops, all planned with them in mind. And a much more joined up approach with more investment in affordable and accessible low emission buses to attract people into public transport as well. So I think it's much, much more joined up approach um, and giving people better and real choices for work or going to school and creating high, healthy environments that are not polluted by vehicle fumes or congestion. And that's one of the lessons from the pandemic is people's um, health, particularly their breathing, is, is really been impacted by COVID. So we've got to go back to looking at much cleaner environments um, and making sure that we build in the infrastructure that's going to make it safe for people. Um, I think for me during the pandemic, it, it's been great walking, watching people walking in local parks, cycling for exercise, hiring bikes, and the rollout of short-term additional pavement and cycle spaces has enabled people to socially distance. Um, and it's been great to see families with children out on bikes on our streets, even when we don't have those um, dedicated spaces. But there's so much more we need to do. And um, some of the changes I've seen in Edinburgh don't always work for everybody. And they don't take sight loss into, exam in, into proper example. And that needs to be fixed. Just want to really finish up by saying that um, before the pandemic, we had 3 million cars licensed in Scotland, the highest ever. And that's ownership up 13% in the previous decade. That means more congestion. It means more space competition. Um, it means slower buses. And if we're going to re-engineer our world, having more affordable and accessible public transport alongside dedicated infrastructure for cycling, walking and wheeling is absolutely critical, but it needs a joined up approach. And if we're going to tackle our climate and nature emergencies, get people back to work safely and get new jobs. Things like building more affordable homes closer to where people work and live and regenerating our town centres with people in them again. It's absolutely critical that we make sure that walking, wheeling and cycling infrastructure is either built in from the start at high quality or that actually when we're reshaping those parts of our communities that it's built in and it's done to quality so that people feel safe and so that they're positively encouraged to use that opportunity to wheel, walk and cycle. And, and that will tackle the big challenges the next Scottish Parliament has to deal with. So that's why I'm really glad to be here tonight and very much looking forward to the questions. Thanks, Suzanne. Sarah, I'm gonna to turn to our panel now. We specifically asked the organisations that we've been working with a great deal over the last couple of years, that's RNIB Scotland and Spinal Injury Scotland, to make sure that we've got a good understanding of the needs of disabled pedestrians because that was the issue that was being brought across to us. So I'm going to turn to Sandra Wilson from RNIB Scotland first for her question. Uh, thanks Suzanne, good evening everybody. My question is, what measures would you put in place to make sure that consultation on infrastructure 
is accessible and meaningful. Thank you, Sandra. Will any of the, um, the candidates like to answer that? We don't need everyone to answer it because we've got lots of questions, but if a couple of you wanted to address that, then please do. Mark? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we need to look at, at good practice. And, you know, I was a councillor previously to becoming an MSP, and there was a great piece of work that Sustrans did in Dunblane around redesigning the streetscape there, making it more accessible, but making it a more pleasant place to actually linger as well. And that was done um, from the bottom up. It was started through a, a, a short planning process that involved the whole community. So I, I think it's important to kind of look at good practice out there. And there's some great designers out there, particularly in organizations like Sustrans, who are really aware of um, how different users use that urban space. So I think sort of looking at, at what has worked on the ground makes a lot of sense. And if that can feed into a new design standard and a new engagement standard for how developers of these projects, be it councils or, or other groups, can actually engage with different communities um, than, than, and, and different stakeholders. I think that's the best way forward. You got to take people with you. Thank you, Carol. I can see your hand as well. Um, I think uh, as a matter of principle, um, our party believes that for, for any decisions and any um, uh, policies that are being looked at, you really need to bring in the people who have the, the lived in experience, the lived experience of that issue, because if you haven't got a sight loss issue, it's extremely difficult to understand what those issues are. And so on principle for decisions on transport or anything else, the people most affected ought to be included in the decision making. But I think specifically in relation to sight loss, uh, we really need to declutter our streets we have an awful lot of street furniture that is simply unnecessary and duplicated, you know, sign after sign, you know, pole after pole, and particularly an issue that the Liberal Democrats have been very concerned about, uh, pavement parking. So cars parked on pavements are a huge impediment to um, people who are walking or uh, wheeling in any way at all. So on those two issues, um, I would say that, that we are quite, we've got a, a policy that you should be including the people who are most affected and in relation to this sight loss issue and other people um, with disabilities out in the streets, the amount of clutter that needs to be removed in terms of street architecture, I think, is, is quite excessive. If you walk along a pavement and just count how many things you pass, either up against the curb or against the, the walls of the buildings and so on, it's quite extraordinary. Graham, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I know, I know you're wanting uh, quick responses. Um, so I'd agree with everything that's been said, but uh, I, I, think, I think this sort of thing should be done automatically. Unfortunately, it's, it's not. Um, uh, and, you know, Mark, Mark knows that as a former councillor, as I do. Um, I think occasionally it's a good idea for councils to maybe do an audit of routes uh, and go around with a disabled person, be they be they blind or, you know, have other, some other type of disability. Um, and that's the way you find out what's wrong. So that, that would be my sort of plea to it. If there's any councillors on, on the call, get your council to do that. Thank you. That's a very practical suggestion. Um, I'm going to ask Maureen now to ask a question, then Sarah, Katrina, you can answer this one. Maureen. Thanks very much. If we could just ask the panel on behalf of our members, um, many disabled people are ignored in the active travel um, agenda. Bike hire schemes have never had non-standard options so that we can just turn up and hire or even book and hire. The more bike hire schemes that are rolled out, the more the equality gap actually widens. So what can be done to reduce these types of inequalities in active travel to give disabled people more options and support the sustainable child, uh, sorry, travel hierarchy? <laughs> Sarah, could you comment on that first, please? Yeah, I'd like to pick that up. And I think the point you make about bike hire is really important. Um, there are new technologies available, like electric bikes and different types of electric bikes or different types of um, cycling that 
need to be available in bike hire and it partly gives people the chance to test it out and see if they're comfortable with it. The other thing in terms of equalities is that if you look at cities like Edinburgh, you can see that actually some of the lower income areas don't have bike hire as well. So there's both a social inequality and a physical um, issue, which is really important to tackle. And, and it's quite important in terms of people who come, who've got um, different physical disabilities in terms of their earning capacity. Um, I know one or two people who can't actually make the same choices because their income is lower. So I think it's got to be a joined up approach. And that's that's something where if we're setting up new opportunities, they've got to have a proper equalities uh, process so that we're not that people are not going to be missing out either where the infrastructure is or what kind of bikes are available. Thanks. Thank you. Katrina, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Maureen. That's a really important question because actually in Edinburgh, and I know other cities have this as well, but I just want to mention Edinburgh, we have a really wide ranging um, bike hire scheme. And that was expanded to include electric bikes, which has meant that people who perhaps don't have the mobility to use a, a, a pedal bike can try it out on an electric bike. And um, I know that that's been really, really popular. I'd like to see it expanded even further. We have a fantastic wee project in Edinburgh called Joy Rides, which is a lady who has a specially designed bike with um, seating on the front of it so that people who don't have the mobility to ride a bike themselves can still get the benefit of you know, being outside, traveling on a bike and um, and get the, the health and the well-being benefits of doing that, as well as travel around, you know, perhaps they don't want to drive a car. I mean, disabled people care about the environment as well. And uh, we need to make sure that they have the opportunity to, to, to take part in active travel measures. So that's a, that's just one idea of a way that we can look at at cycle hire and these kind of communal active travel schemes a little bit more creatively. And um, I think it was, was it, it was Graham that said in answer to the last question of the idea of a, an audit where you actually just ask disabled people, you know, how, what kind of bike do you use, you use at home? What kind of bike would you like to use? Um, or if it's not a bike, what kind of perhaps scooter or motorized vehicle would you like to be able to use? And as part of a joined up long-term holistic view of travel, we can we can start designing so that when we think about a cycle lane, we're not just thinking about pedal bikes, we're thinking about perhaps other kinds of vehicle that are obviously not suitable for pavements, but equally need to be protected from the roads. And I think things like that can help disabled people and people who use wheelchairs or have mobility issues feel more confident about getting involved and, and taking part in active travel. Thank you, Katrina. Um, I'm now going to ask Shagufta uh, from Bikes for Good to uh, come with her question. Thank you, Zan. Good evening, everybody. Uh, there's a lot of chat about um, the kind of financial aspect of um, active travel, but what I'd like to ask is, um, how will you ensure that the right people are in the right roles to spend that money? For example, South City we right on um, Bike for Good South uh, doorstep, and a local uh, road running officer in Glasgow was asked to come and test on his bike, and he said he didn't cycle. He was instrumental um, in that team that was developing the infrastructure. Um, I'm not surprised at the number of issues with that particular path. So how will you ensure the right people are in the right roles to take those plans forward? My internet was breaking up there, Shagufta. I'm not sure if it was me or you. Was anyone able to get that? Sarah's nodding, uh, if you are. Excellent, good. Sarah, do you want to kick off on this one? Shall I start there? off, um, kind of repeat the question, which was basically making sure that the people that take decisions off for planning infrastructure have actually got the right knowledge, skills and commitment. Um, and I used to be a town planner a very long time ago. And I, I remember being told by a road engineer that the best thing they could do for cyclists was to keep them off the roads. 
Um, and that imbued in me a passion for going, no, actually the best thing we can do is to plan our communities better. So there's something about planning for um, the education that people get at universities when they're training to be engineers or planners that make sure that they have experience of um, how do you plan for site loss? How do you encourage people to use safe, active travel routes? How do you design them so that you meet a range of needs? And then there's an issue of accountability to councillors. What kind of policy does a council have? How progressive is it in terms of safer streets, walking, wheeling and cycling? So there's an accountability element in there, but there's also a training element. And then there's an issue about leadership. If we want to make this work, we've got to actually deliver on the ground and that really requires the political leadership, both at the Scottish Parliament and in our councils, and for all of us to try and build that cross-party support to actually make it happen. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, Mark, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I would agree with those points from Sarah. I mean, I, I think you need both aspects of the leadership. You need uh, elected representatives who understand what the issues are within their communities with cycle infrastructure and understand their communities as well. And I think, you know, what Graham was saying earlier about earlier on about, you know, getting elected officials out with their community, seeing what that infrastructure looks and feels like and how it maybe works or doesn't work is hugely powerful. Um, but in order to do that and to include in that discussion, the officials as well, um, I think you need to have strong partnerships locally that can really um, set a vision for what active travel and cycling looks like in the area and, and to include, um, you know, voices that, that represent people with disabilities into that as well. And, and I think if you can get those kind of partnerships strongly working, you can get that shared understanding and you can start doing that kind of planning. In Stirling, we've had um, Cycle Stirling Group, uh, which I used to chair a number of years ago, and it included a lot of voices into that in an active discussion with the council, both officers and councillors, about infrastructure and about what we needed. Um, and I think it was a great learning opportunity for everybody to, to understand what the needs are. Um, but yeah, you need, you need to have that political commitment uh, to having that vision and, and investing in it as well. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to move on um, to questions from the floor. And we've got lots and lots of them, but I'm going to try and focus each one of them on one of the key walk, wheel, cycle, vote asks. So the first one is from David French, and it is, is 3% of the transport budget enough to bring about the changes you think are necessary to make Scotland a place where everyone can walk, wheel or cycle safely? That's uh, one of our key asks is to increase the transport budget from uh, for active travel from where it is at around 3% up to 10% and ongoing until 20%. Would any of the candidates like to comment on infrastructure investment? Graham. Um, yes, I'll kick off because you know what I'm gonna say, Suzanne. Um, and basically I, I will agree that 3% is not enough it isn't enough. Um, where I disagree, well, I don't quite disagree. I, I don't entirely disagree. It's a matter of time, time scale. Uh, I think if we could get to 20%, that would be brilliant. I just don't think it's realistic in the next five years. So I think in the next five years, if we were to jump from 3% of that transport budget to 10%, that's quite a big achievement. Now, you may say, well, it's not enough. It's not enough, but I think you have to be realistic as well. So I think if we if we all agree we've got the ambition, um, I'm just saying uh, I think the realistic target for the next five years is 10%, and then you move on from there. But we definitely we definitely need to do more if we're to, you know, if we're, frankly, to build on the progress that we've had um, through through this last year, of more people um, walking and cycling, which is great. Uh, but if we don't, if we don't improve the infrastructure, that could easily slip back. Katrina. 
Thank you. Yes, um, I, I do support the, the campaign asked to increase the active travel budget. Um, the, and I, I slightly disagree with Graham about the ambition. I think we can hopefully all recognise that the climate crisis is the biggest issue. This is what we should be putting all our resources into tackling. This is um, something that will affect us now and in the generations to come. And reforming and restructuring our travel, how we travel across Scotland, um, is a key part of that. And in terms of the ambition, yes, it's, it's quite a big ask. But if you look at, for example, the um, percentage of capital investment in motorways that went on to active travel in 2017, it was 6.7%. And then in the budget this year, it was 26%. So that kind of increase in funding can happen when there is the political will to do it. And that's where I think that the partnership between the, the Scottish, the, the SNP and the Greens has been quite successful because we have been able to come to an agreement that delivers a budget that increases active travel spending. It has been increasing year on year and we need to see that continuing if we're going to be serious. Everything that we've talked about tonight is there's been some fantastic ideas, but we have to make them happen with investment. So we have to be committed to the long-term goal um, and to investing in the short term to achieve that long-term goal. Uh, sorry, I'll just take issue with that. It hasn't been increasing year on year. It's gone up and down and it's been round about uh, 3%, uh, 2 to 3%. It's not, it's not been that way. It's been more, more like that. Mark. Sorry, let's sorry, let me come to Carol. I've not not heard Carol for a little while. Hi, thanks. Um, well, I, I would agree that obviously 3% is too low and it, it needs to increase from there. But I think when, when we're looking at the whole issue of transport in relation to, to the climate crisis, it is, it is an actual crisis, a real emergency. And in relation to that, the, the the biggest thing that we have to do is get people out of their cars. We really need to get people out of their cars. And the evidence is quite clear that people come out of their cars more readily onto trains than any other system. So our policy to reopen old railway lines wherever possible and open up more stations on existing lines is going to be critical to getting people to stop using their cars. So we definitely wish to increase that active travel budget but we're still working out exactly by how much because we're costing out what is it going to how much will it cost us to get these railway lines up and running because that's going to be the most effective way to get people out of their cars which the climate emergency to us is the number one <coughs> excuse me the number one issue here so certainly you're totally in favor of increasing that budget and we will be announcing shortly by how much we think we could increase it but bearing in mind the urgent need to get people out of their cars and trains look like the most effective way of doing that at the moment. Thank you, right, I think we'll, we'll move on to another, another question, um, which comes from one of our panelists and it is asking for very specific measures. So what measures would you put in place to ensure accessible travel for all and how would you prioritize that? So I think lots of the questions are very focused on actually wanting to know what specific policies. I appreciate not everyone has uh, published a manifesto yet, but does anyone have any specific measures that they are proposing to make travel accessible for everyone, particularly walking, cycling and wheeling? Sarah. Yeah, I, I think go back to the point about there's, there's two things. There's um, infrastructure, which is about our streets and about our pavements and about making sure that it's up to um, the right quality so you don't have poorly um, maintained pavements or streets so that people aren't worried about tripping, so that you've got decent crossings, so that all of our bus stops are designed that are actually usable for people, particularly if they're partially sighted or they've got a physical disability. But I, I think the other thing we need to do is to make sure that people's travel um, walking and cycling and wheeling 
also links into public transport as well, so that that is more accessible, so you can take your bike on the train much more easily, so that you can get a wheelchair on and off a train, so there are staff at the station. And I think there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of making buses more accessible. Um, you can see some of the efforts that have made um, by Lothian buses, which are really good, but there's a lot, an awful lot more needs to be done. And I think for short trips, it's obviously about our pavements and our streets um, and that active travel infrastructure. But I think we've also got to make sure that we redesign buses and trains and make them much more accessible for people um, and also make them affordable. I go back to that point about people not having cash. Um, going to Glasgow by train is really expensive. And our trains in Scotland, now that they're being run by the Scottish government, I think that's an opportunity to lower fares. And I also think buses, um, the fares have gone up over the last few years, but there's also not enough buses. So I think for medium travel, we've also got to be thinking about the link between safer walking and safer streets for people who've got, um, whether it's sight loss or physical disability or restriction, but also joining up the public transport agenda so that it's not just shorter routes we're looking at. It's got to be radical transformation here. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Carol. And I would say that one of the things that we need to do is make sure that anything that we put in in terms of cycle paths, which is, is one of the, 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 the critical infrastructure changes that we need, is they actually have to be continuous. Now, you see uh, at the moment, sometimes bikes are competing with pedestrians on the pavements. And it's usually because a cycle path has disappeared at a critical point. And it's always astounded me that you can have a cycle path on a straight bit of road. And then when you get to the roundabout or the junction, the bit where it's actually a bit tricky, the cycle path simply disappears. And the bikes then go onto the pavements and start using the pedestrian routes. So we actually need that, con that continuity of thinking and of joined up thinking, but also actual physical continuity because if, if you're going to encourage more tentative cyclists onto the road, uh, then that's, that's what they need. They need to know that at no point are they going to be left to navigate a roundabout competing against a lorry and a car. So I think it's, it's that level of detail that's necessary, which is why localised decision making is critical here, because it, it has to be people on the ground who can actually see where, where these dangers lie. I'd have to say in, in a previous incarnation, uh, I was a secondary head teacher and I was asked at one point to encourage my pupils to cycle to school. And I would have been delighted to encourage them to cycle to school, except it just wasn't safe. There were cycle paths and bits of the roads and then no cycle paths. And in all conscience, I couldn't, I couldn't have said to a 12 or 13 year old, it's safe for you to cycle on these roads. So it's that level of detail that's necessary to, to get people to make that decision that it's going to be safe for them to cycle rather than take their car. See lots of heads nodding to that one. Um, we're actually running short of time, so I'm afraid I'm going to make an executive decision to move on to, to a last question, which is, um, I think fundamental to what lots of us feel, but I'm going to add a caveat to it. I think what Wheel Cycle Vote has learned over the last two years, that whilst the majority of us will benefit from the reduction in the dominance of motor traffic, it is still very important for a lot of disabled people to be able to access a car, access car parking. So there's a question here about reducing the dominance of motor vehicles. We want to caveat to make sure that everyone understands that we know disabled people need to be able to access cars and car parking. So we are not promoting an anti-car agenda here with this question. It's which parties are prepared to specifically state policies to constrain, limit and discourage car use, car ownership and motor vehicle dominance in transport planning? Mark was first, I think. Well, I think we need to create better choices for people. And, you know, that's why my party uh, pushed for the power for local authorities to introduce uh, workplace parking, which wouldn't apply to people with, with the disabilities. Um, because we, what we need to do is to create a carrot and stick. You know, we, we need to ensure that if people are accessing workplace parking, that they're paying for that. But we also then use that that money that that measure ra uh, raises 
to then invest in the kind of infrastructure and choices uh, that we really need. So, you know, if Edinburgh had had its um, congestion charge uh, way back, you know, what's it, five, 10 years ago now, it would have more money to have invested into public transport infrastructure, such as, as the trams uh, and walking and cycling infrastructure as well. So, you know, we, we, we do need to see politicians that are prepared to make those hard choices. Um, and, and certainly as a party, you know, when, when we put forward that in the, in the budget um, several years ago, you know, there was howls of opposition coming from, from every party, actually apart from, from the SNP government, um, saying, you know, this is a terrible measure and it's going to penalise people and everything else. But, you know, you, you, you have to make some choices here. And I think, you know, the more that you can raise, the more you can reinvest. So again, you know, my party, to go back on the point about um, bus travel, it's hugely expensive for people in Scotland. The community where I live, eight miles to the west of Stirling, it's 15 quid return for a young person to get on the bus uh, into Stirling and back. So priority for my party has been to make, you know, that free concessionary travel available for young people um, to, to encourage that choice. But where that's not there for people, uh, it becomes difficult. So we need a, bar a, a balance of carrot and stick here. Um, but ultimately, you need to have some measures that, that, are, that, are, that are encouraging people to do the right thing while investing in the, in the alternative choices. Graham and then Katrina, briefly, please. Yeah, well, briefly, I, I, I think the key, the key thing here is not, <clears throat> is not to be anti-car, because as, as you uh, explained, some people, well, many people need, need to use the car. They have no alternative. So what we need to do is create those alternatives. And this is where I agree with Mark. So we, we need to make public transport a lot better, a lot more joined up, um, cheaper. So it's more affordable for everyone to use. Um, and this is where I do agree with the Lib Dems um, that these regional transport partnerships can play a, a key role in this. And if we um, introduce the the measures that were in the Transport Act to allow um, councils to band together to actually uh, run bus services. I think that could be a, a huge step forward where they want to do it. But there are parts of Scotland where that would be really appropriate, including the area where I live. Katrina, on to you. Thank you. Um, in the interest of brevity, I will just say that I completely agree with everything that Sarah was saying about um, making public transport more accessible to disabled people. Like she said, Lothian buses have done a fantastic job on consulting with disabled people and disabled people's organisations to try and make their services better. Um, the SNP have introduced free bus travel for young people and, of course, we've already got free bus travel for older people. Um, I would like to see that extended to everyone because that is one way to make transport more accessible. And we have to give people positive alternatives to taking the car. I mean, part of the reason that some people, especially disabled people need a car is because they need to be able to transport perhaps a wheelchair or they need to be able to travel with a carer. Now, if we can restructure our cities to make sure that public transport is accessible, affordable, and has the facility to accommodate people, then perhaps we would reduce the amount of car use. I think ultimately, um, nobody wants to prevent disabled people traveling by car. That's, I think that's perfectly reasonable. And there are people, including disabled people, who, who do need to use a car. It's the people who don't need to use a car, people who could, if they were more accessible, use active travel options. Um, and I think perhaps a, a useful um, thing to, to look at is, and I think this was actually mentioned in the chat, was the impact that um, the active travel measures are having on disabled people who do drive, um, that disabled parking bays have actually been moved to, to accommodate these um, new measures. Now, when, when I mentioned earlier about making these schemes per permanent, that's an example of where we should be consulting with communities to make sure that what goes in place of the existing infrastructure is something that's improved with appropriate accessible spaces for active travel users and also people who continue to use their cars. Right, okay, it is four minutes to nine according to my clock. So I would like everyone uh, all our candidates to sum up with just one minute before I make a final closing remark. 
Okay, who wants to go first? Or I'll pick on you. Sarah. Right, I'm happy to go first. Um, okay, so we need the buses and trains to be more affordable, more joined up, and using public ownership is a really good way to do that if you look at Edinburgh, but that's got to set aside um, walking, wheeling and cycling being invested in, um, in terms of new infrastructure, but a much more joined up approach and more investment. Um, and in, in addition to the 20 minute neighbourhood, I'd also like to see longer opportunities for walking and cycling and wheeling as well. Somebody put in the chat about rural communities and it's important that we've got that joined up approach, not just in our towns and cities, but right across the country. And the other thing we need is investment for our councils to keep the infrastructure properly maintained. They've had huge cuts over the last decade and that's a real problem. So a much more joined up approach, investment in, in, in giving people better alternatives to driving, um, that's got to be critical because I'll finish on this point, it's got more affordable to use your car over the last decade than travel by public transport. Um, so making making bikes accessible and affordable to people as well, I think would be really good in addition to the infrastructure on the ground. And if we could get all of us who are on this call to actually run our transport policy, that might let us make the breakthrough we want. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Who's next? Graham, I'm gonna pick on you. Well, that's great, I'm loving that idea. Um, we could just get the uh, the people who were on the cross party group for cycling yeah. and walking and buses to to run the transport um, department. That would that, that would be great. Um, we might actually get somewhere. Um, I think yeah, you know the idea that we have a, a joined up system, uh, more affordable public transport. Um, absolutely agree with that. But I think what we need to do is is actually set standards and I was, I was, I was going to say this earlier set the standards of what kind of routes we want so that walking environments should meet the double buggy test and that's where a parent or carer would feel comfortable and would want to walk that would cover the partially sighted or people who are in a wheelchair so only fund schemes that meet certain standards and make sure that each city has a high quality segregated main cycle network with at least two key routes through the city. That sounds good, Mark. Yeah, I mean, as ever, you know, there's always a good degree of consensus at these types of events, you know, when we're talking to a, an audience which is, uh, you know, concerned about, about walking and active travel infrastructure and everything else. My fear is that somewhere else online tonight, there's probably a, a hostings organized by the AA or the RAC, where there's a very different set of messages. There's commitments coming from parties to complete trunk road infrastructure, which is gonna really hold back some of the ambition that is there in your manifesto. So, you know, I, I, I do think you need to continue to hold us all to account um, with the promises that have been made tonight and ensure that we're, we're, we're actually living up to what we've said. But yeah, there's a good degree of consensus. I mean, I think one area we haven't spoken about tonight is just some of the work we need to do around our schools and driving more bikeability programs in schools and building the kind of community infrastructure that allows young people to, to safely um, commute to school and back and what that means for our neighborhoods as well. Um, but yeah, I think, I think all the solutions are there. Um, What's lacking is perhaps the strong vision in local communities, the joined up working, and then the political will to make those tougher choices to actually invest in the future that we that we all want. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Carol, you got a closing comment? Uh, yes, I'll, ju I'll just say three things. Um, First of all, I think we really need to learn from countries that have got this well sussed out, countries like the Netherlands and Germany. And I, and I think uh, I'm not ever in favour of reinventing the wheel if people have already found the solutions to a lot of issues. And so I would say we need to look at what they do and how successful it is and learn from that. Secondly, psychologically, we need to, if we're going to get the population to change their habits, then we're going to have to make it very easy for them. We're going to have to make it very safe. And that means that we need well-lit, clutter-free streets and pathways that people feel confident using. And thirdly, if I did come to look at children, I do think that all children should be taught to ride a bike. 
and be doing the cycle proficiency test when they're in primary school. And we should be encouraging physical fitness in children so that they just take it as natural that they would walk or cycle rather than uh, you know, beg their mother to take them in the car. So we need to get people young to get them to, to develop different habits in, associated with transport. So those are the three things that I would say in summary. Thank you, and Katrina. Well, thank you. I've certainly found it really useful this evening. And I think possibly the thing I found the most useful is um, learning that MSPs and prospective MSPs like me really need to have the opportunity to just hear directly from people who have the ideas that we need to put into practice. Um, I think that what we have, what we will have in the next parliamentary term is we need the need to take short term action to tackle the climate crisis, but also the need to invest in long term action to actually create a better society, to create better communities and better towns and cities that everyone can be included in and everyone can walk, wheel and cycle safely in. Um, I've, it's really good to have a lot of consensus on this issue and I hope that, as uh, Sarah says, we can carry this across into Parliament and deliver some positive change and I hope that we can continue to keep engaging in the way that we have this evening. So thank you very much and um, I look forward to hopefully coming back in five years time and saying we've done it all. That would be truly wonderful. Um, Thank you very much to, uh, to everyone for coming along, to our panellists and our candidates. I'm afraid there were many, many great questions that we didn't ask. You will have plenty of opportunities to ask those at other um, supporter events. So Cycling UK and Pedlon Parliament are running hustings that many of you, I think, will be at on the 20th. Sally, is that correct? Of next month she's pulling a face oh it's too difficult at this time in the evening i think just to pick up on one of those final points is that the dutch and the danes get many things right but they don't get accessibility right um, so there's many things we can learn from them but i think scotland has the opportunity to lead in this particular area to make sure that walking wheeling and cycling is accessible for everyone to make sure that our town cities streets and communities are places where everyone feels safe not just those who are on a bicycle uh, or those that can see and move around with ease. Um, Scotland has it in its capacity to be able to do this and, and perhaps even quietly lead the world in this uh, particular area. So thank you very much for coming along. My colleague Jim has just popped uh, the Cycling UK hustling information into the chat. Please take a look at that. Um, many of the questions that didn't get asked tonight could... Uh, move across that to that evening. Thank you everyone, have a good rest of your evening and we'll undoubtedly see you again. Don't forget to follow us on our social media and encourage your candidates to uh, respond to the survey that they've all received by now. Thank you everyone. <laughs>